Welcome back everybody. So again we are here on Interspeech and it's day two. We have already seen several exciting presentations yesterday, did some interviews and also today there is more interesting things coming up. So again Kathy will be accompanying me and we even found a third partner to help us with the video. So Kathy, do you want to introduce? Of course. So um, say hello to Samantha Worldly and she is participating in Interspeech um, 2021. She uh, even has a correct formal participant. Yeah, badge. yes. <laughs> oh, she is totally registered and she will be joining for everything. And uh, so, where are you from, Samantha? She can be a bit um, silent at sometimes, maybe shy um, in front of the camera. But uh, so. So where are you from? She's cosmopolitan and not only international. So so uh, uh, she will be joining us with everywhere. And in case you didn't know Samantha, Samantha is also a YouTube star. She has her own YouTube channel and if you're interested in that, you can check it out here. So Let's go to the conference. Let's have some fun at Interspeech. Yes. So, now let's have a look what happened here on day two at Interspeech. And we had a look at several of the sessions. We had a look also at some of the virtual posters. And I must admit, there was one that I really liked um, by Susumu Saito, and it's entitled uh, Vocal Turk, Exploring Feasibility of Crowd-Sourced Speaker Identification. And it's a really cool paper because they had like 3,854 workers, and they show how to design the interfaces, how to deal with the reliability of the assessment, and you can learn actually quite a bit from that paper. So I really enjoyed that. Another thing that I found really cool was uh, Min Chu's effects of aging on age-related hearing loss on talker discrimination. So in that paper, they look at how the ability to discriminate different persons is decreased, first of all, with age and second, with hearing loss. Mm -hmm. Obviously something that you would expect that it is not improving if you hear worse, but they really quantify that in a very nice study. So that's also a really cool paper. Hmm. What did you like? So I, it's, it's, it's impressive that you have been following the virtual talk and also the in-person talks. I was really um, just running around for the uh, on in-person talks. Yeah, I and, guess and, that's yeah, the it's, hybrid it's, conference. <laughs> but it's impressive. Um, so the, the with the hybrid uh, on in uh, in-person talk, the, there was the survey talk. Um, about uncovering the acoustic use of COVID-19 infections. So that was, uh, yeah, there was the second survey talk. So I guess if you're working on COVID-19 detection or anything related, you definitely want to check out the results on the acoustics. So there's also several cues in the acoustics. So quite interesting. Yes, yes. How did you like the keynote? Oh, the keynote was wonderful too. Um, it was given by Pascal Fong. And it was about the ethical and technological challenges of conversational AI. So I, I have been um, listening to multiple sessions of uh, conversational AI, but um, addressing the ethical and um, ethical challenges was really nice about this talk, I thought. So if you want to build conversational AI and you don't want it to be racist or do strange political things, because you may have trained with data from the internet, you definitely want to listen to that presentation because she has all the tricks in there how to make your chat robots behave. Yes, yes, exactly. Yes. So after that, <laughs> I, 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 I was totally into this um, uh, wonderful session um, with uh, speech pathology. That Absolutely. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm working in the, um, biomedical engineering so this is um, really re um, relevant to what I'm working on, and I was. Um, this was two-hour session, and this. I uh, when you're having fun, time flies. Absolutely, I think the entire session was really great. Yes. So it was really nice to 
essentially all of the presentations were great. So I think so. Yeah, I was very. If uh, you're into into speech pathology, so it started with automatically detecting errors and disfluencies in red speech to predict cognitive impairment in people with Parkinson's disease. Uh, that was presented by Armit uh, Romana. And I think that was a really nice work on Parkinson's disease, but there were also many other good presentations. Yes, um, the the design of the, the, the cognitive um, test was, I, I thought that was kind of cool. The, the next one was about automatic extraction of speech rhythm descriptions for speech intelligibility assessments for head and neck can cancers. Yeah, so this was given uh, by Robin, Robin Reyes, yes. and it was really nice because you would think that speech intelligibility is mainly connected to the ability to identify certain words, so it should be done only with ASR, you may assume, but he could also show that the prosody and the, the way how, uh, speak, uh, how people are really speaking, the rhythm, is really a determining factor also for the assessment of speech intelligibility in head and neck cancer patients. So that's a little bit surprising that the rhythm is associated, but the talk also gives some very nice explanations why this may actually be the case. So that's a really nice presentation. Yeah, yeah, I, I really thought so. And then the next one you really liked. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yes. So there was uh, Jinzi Ki, and she presented on speech disorder classification using extended factorized hierarchical variational audio encoders. Mm -hmm. And the cool thing is that she essentially build an embedding that could differentiate, disentangle essentially the actual what was spoken about, so essentially the automatic speech recognition result, which word is spoken, and then the characteristics of the speaker. So the way how she implemented this is she was training actually with traditional databases in order to disentangle the speaker information from what is actually said. And the cool thing is that if you use those representations, you can also infer pathology from this, although during the extraction and the representation learning approach, pathology didn't play a single role. So that's actually quite surprising that you can find embeddings that would differentiate between what is said and how it is said, and it is also a good predictor of five different pathologies. So that's a cool work. Yes. So I, I think was, you really like the next presentation. <laughs> yes, I definitely did. So I have been working with GOP, goodness of pronunciation, and there was this related work. Um, it was called the impact of force alignment errors on automatic pronunciation, pronunciation evaluations, and um, this is um, a work by Don, a work done by um, University of Texas. And uh, so these are Barish. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry if I mispronounced, but um, yeah, it was, it was, it, it was just really nice work. So if you mispronounce it, just type it into the comments. <laughs> so, so it was. Uh, it, this work was about force alignments, and this has an influence on GOP, of course. But um, this study is. Um, was really disentangling the automatic phonetic segmentation errors from pronunciation or acoustic errors, which was like, uh, I, I, this, this was a really nice idea. I mean, really, GOP yeah. is around since the 90s or something? Yeah, uh, uh, 1999 um, by um, Vita Nyong. Yeah. Uh, and, and, uh, it's, it's, and then like, oh, you can, uh, it, it was marvelous to just, just to see this kind of research with, um, yeah, so uh, with, uh, of, of yeah, course the yes, first alignment, yes. you might suspect it just plays a huge role. Yes, yes. And it's really nice how they put it together and looking into what part of the mistakes come from the force alignment problems, because of course if there is problems with the red speech, then, uh, then it would also have influences on the alignment, right? Yes, of course. And then the study yeah. essentially shows that the influence of the misalignment isn't actually that big yes, and yeah, was, this is probably also why GOP is so popular yes, because yes. it still works if the mm -hmm. alignment is slightly broken. Yes. Yeah. And then the data was data that they used was like uh, also like um, very impressive. Like yeah, the, the, the children um, data. Well, I think yeah. more, more than 80 speakers yeah, yes, and uh, yes, control group yes, and yes. children's speech. So really cool work. I think so. Yeah. 
I saw then this presentation uh, by Matthew uh, Doss, and I think this was also really nice because he had this nice linguistic assessment for essentially language disorders. So he looked into depression and dementia recognition, and they found a very nice way how to model the active vocabulary in a person. And then he also showed that on top of the language assessment, you can use acoustic cues to even improve the recognition of the respective uh, yes. disorders. So yes. that was impressive. Work. And and there was this really nice slide that I must um, 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 highlight. Um, this uh, with the um, mental lexic lexicon, and and also it was kind of uh, you know there will be another um, survey talk about the multimodal um, speech processing. And mm -hmm. it's, it's, I, I was kind of think, uh, relating to um, this. Um, the, the, the mental the, the, lexicon is not only about speech, but it's, it's really like conceptual, contextual. And um, um, so it's, uh, it's, it's, that's what I was thinking about. And then like that, that will be coming up in the next um, survey talk. Yeah, but it's it's nice because it's not just the, the lexicon size, so how large the active vocabulary is, but it's also acoustic cues that are, of course, in depression, that you have less energy and you talk more in a, in a less emotional state and so on. So it absolutely makes sense. And to show that was really a great work. So yes. I can definitely recommend to have a look at this paper. Yes. So the next talk, and I think that was the last talk in oh, the yes. session, yes. was about neural speaker embeddings for ultrasound-based silent speech interfaces. And this has been given uh, by Amin uh, Shandiz. And the, he was really looking at a very challenging problem. So he was trying to predict only from an ultrasound probe essentially held here to the floor of your oral cavity to essentially track the tongue movement without any phonation and predict from that the spectrum of the speech that would probably emerge from that state. And what was pretty cool is that if they did that only in a single speaker setup, then they could more or less reconstruct the, the spectrogram only from the tongue movements that were captured by ultrasound. As of course the ultrasound probe placement is not that easy and the task gets much more difficult if you have variable speakers and also several setups. Every time you mount the probe anew there is a shift and of course that makes problems and he's suggesting several ways how to compensate for that. So that was really a cool presentation. Yes. So let's see whether this will be helpful for, for patients in the future. Yeah. And also there was the nice Q&A with the articulatory um, feature detection. Yeah. 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 And it's, I think this is definitely something yeah, we, um, the research could, yeah, uh, interesting research could be done, yes. So we almost forgot about Samantha. Did Samantha also have a favorite presentation? Samantha? Where is she? Where is she? She is here. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, Samantha, would you like to um, talk about your favorite talk of yesterday? Mm, you can speak a bit louder. Maybe you need to help her. Yes. I, uh, she just um, talks in a different frequency range, I think. So, so it can't I, be captured I, yeah. by the microphone? Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's just uh, the microphone problem. It's not Samantha problem. Um, and, okay, so... It's quite a high pitch, I must admit. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, her, she, she just told me that her favorite pre presentation was about orca slang. It's her... Ocean, ocean slang. Yes, yes. So it's our uh, ocean. Animals, yeah, yeah. of course. Yeah, I mean, it's her friends yeah, in the ocean. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. She has she's, orca friends. Yeah. Do you? <laughs> and, yeah, so it was a wonderful um, presentation given by Christian Bergler, um, automatic multi-stage semi-supervised deep learning framework for large-scale killer whale call type identification. And um, this was, uh, I, I, I really find this, um, I mean, it's really interesting research. Um, the data is so impressive with 
twenty thousand hours of recording. This is yeah, like, and so then this like is the archive, yeah, right? twenty thousand hours. And then of, I, I of animal just, yeah, and then when I was uh, listening, um, and Samantha was listening, and then we could uh, we can really like talk, think how much noise. Um, this could have uh, had the the, the data set. Yeah, of the data is yeah, yeah. So it was. So he, I think he Just really boats passing by in the twenty thousand yeah, hours. Yeah, yes, so exactly. Yeah, exactly. Most of the data you can't use, and what is really interesting is there are these call type catalogs yeah. where they kind of try to build a word system for orcas based on the spectral representations and he built this automatic clustering approach that would try to mimic this and then also try to find subclasses of these words and what's super interesting is there's two types of orcas living in the canadian coastlines and the one are residents they live essentially at the place and they develop a rich vocabulary and they talk to the other orcas and they have this set of calls that they're can found in, in the in the language. And then there are the transients. And the transients they live more in the deeper regions and they hunt and essentially eat everything they can get. And they don't have this rich vocabulary, or at least we don't understand it as much. And the transients are also not that frequent, so we have not too much evidence of them. So when Christian was trying to do this automatic clustering for identifying the orca calls, he found a new type. And then they checked the lab books where they found actually where these new types appear. And turns out that the new call types are actually the ones that are produced by transients. So those that are essentially hunters and they just move from spot to spot and they are not living like residents. So his automatic clustering approach essentially brought up exactly those calls that are not very well understood. So I think this is really a great tool to getting to understand animals much better here in the case of orcas, but maybe at some point it will also help us to communicate with some matter better. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, um, so I, I was I, it, it, it was really impressive that um, so there's the knowledge from the biologist side, and then there's this um, what we can do with um, um, machine learning, and Absolutely. then we, we can. Uh, this is a really coll collaboration, and um, yeah, this is and Christian Bergler, like I think he's doing a really nice work on this. I have been following. I mean, where um, yeah, yeah. So since TSD, so yep. So and Very then nice and work. then yep. And then so let's see whether we can sneak in Samantha into the reviewers reception. Oh. That's gonna be tonight. <laughs> no, it, uh, yes, yes. <laughs> see you. See you. Bye bye. <laughs>